Hello? Sir, sir, minute, one minute. So, uh, good evening, everybody. So, today we will have an interesting session and uh, with us, our eminent speakers and all the panelists here for today's evening. And uh, uh, I am Dr. Gunadar Padi, consultant, coordinator, and uh, uh, the uh, chief transplant and heart lung transplant coordinator in Apollo Hospital, Navi Mumbai. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with this, uh, we'll be starting our today's talk. The today's session will be on very interesting on the nutrition. So, basically, Today we have eminent speaker, Dr. Suval Dikhi, sir. So, uh, sir needs no introduction. Basically, sir is the chief intensivist director and uh, he's basically working in Sanjeevani Hospital and NGM Hospital, Pune. So, we are glad to have him here today in our this uh, panel discussion and the today's program. So, I welcome you, sir. Today's Thank program you. on Apollo Mumbai Critical Care Learning Network. And with us, uh, my co-colleague, Dr. Akles. Dr. Akles Tandekar is consultant intensivist, Apollo Hospital, Navi Mumbai. And uh, with us, our eminent Hello. panelist, so Dr. Rabindar Reddy, sir, sir is from Hyderabad Care Hospital, and uh, he needs no introduction. Basically, he has special interest on diet, diet and nutrition. That's why we have called him here. And with us, Dr. Sumit Rai, he is the chief intensivist from Canberra Hospital, Australia. And with us, Dr. Khalid Khatib from uh, SK, SK Medical College, Pune. So I welcome all the panelists to, to this interesting and interactive sessions. And uh, with us, our dietitian, Pooja Lakhani. So she will be going to speak on a very interesting, uh, uh, some of the aspect of the critical care nutrition. So with this, let's start our sessions and uh, hand over to you, sir. Dikhi, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gunadar, for the warm introduction. Thank you for the invite and thank Apollo uh, team for asking me to talk on this topic on how to feed patients or to feed or not to feed. Basically, we know that the concept of critically ill patients, all our patients are in a hypercatabolic state. They're in a rapid state of malnourishment. And if you really analyze by any way the dietitians normally do or the intensivists, we find that 50% of these patients are malnourished. Majority of these patients are of Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, malignancy, even those patients coming from the old age homes can be getting admitted with chest infections, COPD, all these patients basically are very in a hypercatabolic state. They get admitted because of some disease process or pneumonias, UTI, and as a result of which they're malnourished and 50% of these patients really malnourishment is very, very important. So to feed or not to feed, not to feed the question doesn't arise. All patients, you have to give nutrition and nutrition needs to be given right from the start. And it is very, very important aspect as far as the management of concern of all other system support is concerned. Because we know that in case if you don't feed the patients, there is going to be a longer length of hospital stay. There will be higher morbidity, mortality and muscle wasting is very important. Like in case if you don't feed, almost persons in this hypercatabolic state can lose a muscle mass almost about 900 grams per day. And therefore, a nutritional muscle component has to be a vital component of the multiple organ failure. But at the same time, it has to be an organ support like what you give mechanical ventilation for lung. You give dialysis for renal replacement therapy. You have also got accords for CO2 removals. So all these other systems which are there, a nutrition prescription has to be planned within the first 24 hours, whenever the patients get admitted to the intensive care unit. As we saw that if you don't feed the patients adequately, if the cumulative energy deficit, if you really see the table on the right hand side, if the cumulative energy deficit goes on increasing, that means if you don't feed the patients from day one after admission, then you find that definitely these patients are into a high chance of a severe hypercatabolism. There are increased chances of immunosuppression and these patients will land up into sepsis. There will be a longer length of hospital stay. There will be more amount of morbidity or mortality. vis vis if you compare the cumulative energy deficit with less than 10,000 kilocalories, the chances of these patients landing up into sepsis or the mortality or the length of hospital stay or the ICU stay is also going to be on the lesser side as compared to that. So most important, 
timing in the initiation is crucial. We know that time is muscle as far as the cardiac is concerned, time is brain as far as the stroke is concerned. Similarly here, for better outcomes, timing of initiation of nutrition support is important. So early feeding is very important in these critically ill patients and the demand versus supply gap, what you see here, that really has to be kept minimum. And if the demand versus supply gap goes on increasing, the cumulative energy deficit goes on increasing and as a result of which the outcomes also gets bad. We know that along if you don't feed them with proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, calorie depletion, definitely there's going to be a loss in the lean body mass. And especially if you're dealing with a surgical patient, there will be an impaired wound healing. These patients can also be hypoalbuminemic. They can also have burst abdominals. Those patients of COPD, they can be prolonged ventilation. There will be difficulty to wean. Or these patients can also have immune suppressed immune suppression and which can precipitate infections or uh, sepsis and therefore the mortality and morbidity will go up. There is early initiation of nutrition therapy is important and as a result of which you have got the time windows as far as cardiac uh, thrombolysis, stroke thrombolysis. Similarly here, it has given you 24 hours to plan the nutrition prescription and start initiating it to optimize almost about 80% of the calorie goals within the first 72 hours. Of course, specialty and these fancy forms of fish oils and glutamine are available. They have got very limited use into medical intensive care units, although they still have certain role into surgical intensive care units with Dr. Reddy will agree in the panel. And if we will, of course, discuss it and we'll go forward. Most important for all the students, yes, not only these critically ill patients, you must see that studies have shown way back that even nutrition has to be given for even a stable patients who get admitted to the wards. Because in case if you compromise nutrition, even in these patients in the wards, the same principle applies, the increased length of hospital stay, morbidity, mortality. That's very important. Take an example of a simple fracture neck femur who has just been recovered, operated, and if you don't feed them, then definitely there will be weakness, there will be mobility problems, especially if the protein content or if the nutrition calories are not being given adequately to the patients. Or a patient of stroke who is just recovered, being shifted out, if the nutrition again gets compromised, definitely is going to be a problem as far as the mobility, the physiotherapy, and whenever he wants to do uh, exercise. And now mobility and physiotherapy have played a big role and their concepts of physiotherapy have also changed. Early mobilization is a part of the first care of all patients who have now been admitted to the intensive care units. So nutrition is an essential component as much as what you and me eat also eat daily. So nutrition assessment is very, very important. It has to be done daily. We have got various ways to see the Nutrix score, which has been come up with different parameters, taking into consideration the Apache or the SOFA. Indirect calorimetry is the gold standard and the best way to calculate depending upon the energy expenditure and the carbon dioxide, oxygen consumption and the CO2, the subjective global assessment, the universal screening tool of the must and the ultrasonographic muscle thickness is there or the NRSUs. Commonly, if you really analyze it, most commonly, it has been the subjective global assessments or nutrition risk screening, which is being used. But there are certain institutes in India and, of course, Bombay, I know of two institutes. I don't have any institute in Pune, at least. But Bombay, there are two institutes where indirect calorimetry is being used. And that is a much more sensitive and one of the gold standard as far as calculating the nutrition prescription is concerned, although it is uh, costly and definitely time cumbersome but it is one of the gold standard and the most sensitive and the specific way to help us to plan the nutrition prescription. So the assessment initially guidelines have suggested that you should plan it. Does the use of nutrition risk indicator identify the patients who will most likely to benefit? Most important, they have said that yes, the Nutrix score or the NRS score, they have to be performed in all patients who are admitted to the intensive care units for whom definitely if you think that the nutrition intake is not going to be sufficient and definitely high nutrition support have to be given to these patients as early as possible and they're likely to benefit from early enteral nutrition support and that is very, very important. We did analyze it and did publish it as should the evidence which is generated from well-developed countries in the West, is it really helpful and applicable into this? And this came up into clinical nutrition where I was authored uh, along with Khalid also here. 
and we published this just a year, year ago. We took into consideration the nutric score. Mind you, it takes into consideration the age, the Apache, the SOFA, the comorbidities. The comorbidities is equivalent to the stress factor what we were taking into consideration before and also took into consideration the days in the hospital from day one to ICUs and importantly, the inflammatory marker of interleukin-6. Initially, a few years ago, before the pre-COVID era, not all hospitals in India really could monitor the interleukin-6 levels and therefore the exact formulations of the calculation of nutric score should could have been deficient. But now because of the COVID, almost each and every hospital, whether it's big or small or tertiary, has been doing the interleukin-6 level. Mind you, it's just the inflammatory marker to tell you severity. There have been limitations as far as this nutric score is concerned because most of the things interleukin-6 level Levels cannot be measured. And similarly, in non English speaking countries, you also need to translate it and adapt it, the nutri score into the languages. And this is, has got very limited availability in all the countries. And similarly, not all ICUs are quite still geared up and they do not monitor the Apache scores or the SOFA scores in all uh, intensive care units. And therefore, these are certain limitations as far as the use of nutri score into it. As I said, indirect calorimetry is the best whenever it's available and most importantly it is the best way to recommend it even as far as the guidelines of concern initially the, even the guidelines in the latest so 16 17 have also suggested that indirect calorimetry it is the gold standard and it helps you to give, exactly give you uh, the exact amount of deliveries which is there if you really compare indirect calorimetry vis a vis with the other forms of scores or the old age old Harrison's periodic equations, what we were taking into consideration, there have been inaccuracies as far as the delivery of nutrition support by almost about 60% into these patients. And with the advent and availability of indirect calorimetry, almost the nutrition prescription can now be optimized to almost about 90%. Mind you, it know it works and calculates upon the energy expenditure and also based upon the requirements of oxygen in the, and the generation of carbon dioxide. And definitely it was found that it is much more sensitive as well as specific. Although there is certain ventilators now which tells you the energy expenditure, to my knowledge, there is a G care station which tells you the energy expenditure, the carbon dioxide uh, generation, as well as the oxygen consumption. So indirectly, it also tells you the, the calorie deficit and the calories what really need to be optimized. And that's one of the ventilators. If certain institutes have the luxury of using it, definitely, even if they don't have an indirect calorimetry, they can plan and optimize the nutrition prescription in a much more efficient and a much more precise way so that it can be tailored from patient to patient. Mind you, nutrition assessment is very important. And in case if you don't feed the patients and a proper assessment is not done, then definitely you're going to compromise the care of the patient as much as you tune the ventilator or decide the dialysis prescription, the antibiotic protocols for de-escalation and the monitoring the antibiograms. These are very, very important. And as I said, indirect calorimetry is the best and it has to be used always. It is much more effective and you should start off with 25 to 30 kilocalories depending upon the ideal body weight. Now, how to feed the patients? The root is very, very important. And most important is to use the gut and the enteral root of nutrition support is much more important. There have been certain benefits of into those patients where the baseline, uh, those who cannot feed, their total parental nutrition support was considered. But mind you, the concept of total parental nutrition now has moved away from total parental nutrition support to partial parental nutrition support or supplemental partial parental nutrition support. The source of nutrition, all of you like what me, you, you and me eat is the thali, but here it needs to be supplied. The source is given from carbohydrates in the form of glucose, of course, lipids and proteins in the form of amino acids. And mind you, electrolytes, trace elements and vitamins also play a very equal important role. Mind you, carbohydrates like as well as the amino acids give you about four kilocalories of energy and lipids, of course, they give you nine kilocalories of energy. And now lipids are equally important because there have been myths and conceptions that yes, lipids increase infections, total parental nutrition increases the infections, but mind you, no, they don't increase infections, but mind you, using lipids into a smaller quantity or a smaller volume can deliver more number of calories, especially you want to have or feed the patients with a 
the cardiac cachexia, especially if the patient is there with a renal failure, with a fluid overload, you don't want to lead them, but he needs to be given nutrition support. You can give a small volume of lipids, but at the same time, it will help you to give more number of calories and mind you the entire prescription does not just depend upon giving carbohydrates lipids amino acids it has to be a combination along with the liquid lip, the electrolytes the trace elements of selenium magnesium so, or zinc everything and the most important form is a combination which is important and i would definitely stick with the fancy forms of nutrition support of glutamine and fish oil and arginine, which I'll cover it up in the following slides during the talk. The ratios can vary from person to person. This is what a standard of 50s to 30s to 20, where carbohydrates forms about 50%. Proteins about 20% and fat about 30%. But mind you, in certain subset of patients, you need to modify it for in patients of COPD. You don't want the carbon dioxide production to go up, so the carbohydrate content will go up, the protein content will also go up. It will also vary in persons of trauma, burns, or polytrauma or in acute severe pancreatitis, when you need to give more number of proteins and more number of calories because of associated comorbidities or a diabetic patients where you need to reduce it. So it's going to be tailor-made for the this definitely giving nutrition it has to be individualized that's what and that's what it has to be a good rapport with your dietitians and therefore the dietitian has to be available with you on all your rounds and the nutrition prescription really needs to be planned in consumption with him or her on the round as i said the enteral nutrition support is the easy one you must use the gut or you lose it it is much more cheaper physiological it prevents a translocation and most importantly since it prevents translocation it also helps to avoid the complications of the migration of bacteria because in case if the histopathological studies have shown that yes there will be villous atrophy in case if you don't use the gut and that will break the defensive barrier of the intestine and that will then promote the bacterial translocation to precipitate infections and uh, the complications will occur. This is the standard which has come up uh, from any textbook. How will you start feeding the patients? As we said that, yes, definitely all assessment needs to be done on admission. The nutrition prescription as much should be planned as fast as possible. And definitely you must see that once enteral nutrition has been initiated within the first 24 hours, of course, start off with full strength, the age-old concept of starting with test speeds, 50 ml today, then 100 ml tomorrow, 150 ml, those concepts have changed. Definitely start off with a full strength concentration. See that and don't hesitate to use pre-kinetic, pro-kinetics and in the form of metacopamide and erythromycin and try to reach at least 80% of the calorie goals, what is required for the patient within the first 72 hours by 72 hours and assist well RB. Of course, once you have met the goals, then that's fine. You can just continue to feed the patients enterally. But mind you, in case if you find gastric distension coming up of a large number of gastric fluid uh, regurgitation which is occurring, then please use prokinetics and then continue to feed the patients by reducing the rate of feeding by half or then consider to use the post-pyloric feeding with the help of a jejunal tube or with the help of a feeding pump where you can control the rate of feeding to the patients. The deficit number of calories in case if you definitely cannot give or uh, achieve 80%, then you must use the parental nutrition support or supplemental parental nutrition support to bridge the deficit number of calories so that you don't compromise the nutrition prescription. So this is where the role now really comes up of total parental nutrition. The definition has changed. There is a very few subset of patients who require TPN, but mainly it is supplemental parental nutrition or partial parental nutrition support, which plays a very important role to bridge the deficit number of calories so that you don't compromise the nutrition prescription in any of these patients. Of course, the plan of nutrition, we said enteral is the best form, parental in very, very few percentage of patients, and the most favorite combination is enteral plus parental or sometimes partial parental nutrition support in case if you cannot bridge the deficit number of calories. And combination is very, very important. And along with the combination, bridge and give the exact number of delivered to the calories, control and control the electrolytes, check the electrolytes, have a very meticulous glycemic control so the sugar levels are kept properly, Def definitely use pre and pro kinetics so that the motility also is maintained and use post pyloric feeding so that the aspiration goes down and definitely once you have achieved the feeding, definitely remember to titrate the doses of pro kinetics where you have been using, otherwise later on you will be thinking why the diarrhea is also 
also getting precipitated. And that's what is very, very important. And see that the calorie deficit or the cumulative calorie deficit does not go on increasing. There are few, very few subset of patients who need parental nutrition. Those who have got a real bad gut functions or a major intestinal resection, a large number of uh, meters or feet of intestines have been removed. A very advanced form of ulcerative or a Crohn's disease, there is severe malnourishment. So those who are not anticipated to eat orally for a few days. And those who require a very aggressive nutrition support who's going to undergo a major surgery, especially in those of medicancy or a malnourished, severely malnourished patients who is going to be optimized, those are there. As far as the glucose control, yes, there have been various thoughts. There have been the intensive insulin therapy, which came out way back by in NEGM from Greet Vandenberg, where she studied patients of the post-operative patients of CABG and tried to keep the sugar levels between 80 to 120. Definitely, there was associated with hypoglycemia into it, but this was backed up by the nice sugar levels from Australia, and they said that the sugar levels should be kept between 150 to 180 levels. And I had the honor to work and even the privilege uh, with Dr. Ravinder Reddy, Dr. Yatin Mehta, and few dietitians also we came up with the Indian Dysglycemic Guidelines for Control of Sugars and we published in the Indian Journal a couple of years ago. And we have said that the sugar level should be kept reasonably well under control between 150 to 180. And this applies across the board of all spectrums of intensive care units, made a burns patients or a polytrauma or a head injury, neurosurgery, renal replacement patients, or even those patients who are hepatic transplants, post-transplant also patients. All patients, the sugar level should be kept reasonably well under control. In these guidelines, we have recommended that the sugar level should be kept or monitored at least seven times daily in these critically ill patients. That's very important. And of course, do not forget to calibrate the glucometers. That's very, very important. Mind you, for the sugar control, it is very, very easy to achieve in case if you give a dual energy, which is a combination of glucose plus lipids, and sometimes fish oils are used to, again, lower the insulin resistance, but mind you, into a very subset of patients of polytrauma, burns, or advanced malignancy patients, or traumatic brain injuries, but no longer these fancy or the immunonutrition is no longer being used into medical ICUs because of the redox trial, which came up because of precipitation of renal failure or because on inpatients of septic shock. So what do the guidelines say? I'll go through it. Initially, the guidelines say that in case if the feeding is or the blood pressure is not on the lower side, stop feeding. I agree with that. See that the mean arterial pressure is approximately above 60, 65 to start feeding. Definitely, they have again suggested that in case it's there, there will be chances of paralytic ileus, there will be mesenteric ischemia, there will be gut hypoperfusion. But now these guidelines in 2012 and 16, they data said that you can start feeding the patients as long as the fluid status of the patient is optimized. Once the fluid has been optimized, the MAP is also optimized above 65. Then, and when you have got a reducing doses of vasopressors, that is one of the things they have said for the definition of optimization of the fluid status into these patients. And of course, do not use uh, here. Enteral nutrition support is the best way to start initiation of nutrition support. The guidelines are going to define severe nutrition support into those patients, those who have got a BMI of less than 18, or those who have got a weight loss of 10 to 15% within the last six months, or there is a class C in the subjective global assessments and the sebum albumin levels with, when there is no evidence of hepatic or renal dysfunction of less than three. Now, mind you, pre-albumin levels are one of the most sensitive and specific here, but not all again, units can monitor the pre-albumin levels into the lab. So albumin was taken as one of the indicators into it. And whenever you are starting nutrition support, as I said, as the guidelines even said, plan the nutrition prescription within the first 48 hours. Once the patients get admitted into the intensive care unit, it requires a full assessment. It requires time. You need to plan the nutrition course along with the dietitian. And in case if you have the luxury of indirect calorimetry, it is a much more better way to do it. And start off by giving about 25 to 30 kilocalories of ideal body weight. And you should use a combination and try to use and achieve at least 80% of the calorie goals within the first 72 hours. 
centrally in case if you cannot achieve it definitely use supplemental parental nutrition support to bridge the deficit number of calories and of course the protein content should be approximately about 1.5 grams per kg body weight as per the guidelines but in those patients who are dealing with a higher nutrition score for example in burns or in trauma polytrauma patients or these patients may require higher protein content even up to 2 grams of per kg of ideal body weight now which route of feeding they have suggested whether it should be a gastric feeding or only precisely there is no significant difference as far as the efficacy whether you are starting with a gastric feed or a jejunal kind of feed but mind you those patients who cannot tolerate the gastric feeds or those patients who have got increased chances of regurgitation which are coming up or those who cannot protect the airway it is always better to use a post pyloric feeding or the jejunal kind of feeding and definitely try to optimize it enteral route of nutrition support over a period of time enteral as i said is the preferred route and it is one of the best route to give it and because all studies have again shown even visa this compared that yes it reduces the length of hospital stay morbidity it is quite cost effective and very very important in these patients whether enteral or parenteral nutrition support should be considered and they have usually suggested to use enteral over parenteral nutrition support and in majority of the patients the use as i said is only limited only to supplemental parenteral nutrition support into the subset of patients to bridge the deficit number of calories should exclusively parenteral nutrition support should be used no exclusive parenteral nutrition support should not be used into all medically ill critically ill patients and you should use a combination of enteral plus supplemental or pure enteral and what is there and definitely these have shown the results have shown that the morbidity as well as the mortality rate has also is gone down in case if you do not optimize the prescription into these patients so using a combination is the best way you see that the patient is not into intestinal obstruction there is no amount of severe shock the fluids are optimized the cvp is maintained the map is above 65 there is no gut ischemia unless the strong contraindication is that there is a severe intestinal obstruction the patient is going to be taken up for surgery or a major intestinal resection has been done or a major gastric uh, surgeries have been done or a partial gastrectomy or major esophageal gastrectomies have been done in these situations you can again discuss it and in with the surgeons that these patients sometimes can again come out of the ot with a feeding jejunostomy and try to achieve and start enteral nutrition support jejunally and try to start feeding the patients now we know that nutrition support initially we still have the concept of relatives coming uh, to the hospital with bananas and apples and xyz things from home of course these are the kitchen feeds the kitchen feeds are not good i'm sorry to say but that's the reality when you are talking science and scientifically kitchen feeds and the best forms to feed are the polymeric available commercially available formula feeds and the peptide based and even we have got the fermentable soluble fiber based which are there the various studies have again suggested and the ispen guidelines have suggested that commercially available standard polymeric feeds they have to be used in all patients whether it's a medical icu or a surgical icu in initiation of enteral nutrition support in all the patients whenever you are using it and various studies which have again suggested blenderized versus using the kitchen feeds the kitchen feed the problem is one you don't know the exact number of calories which have been delivered to the patients you don't know how they have been prepared you don't know what is the mixing content of it you don't know the osmolarity or the viscosity of it but at the same time this of this if you compare it with the commercially available formulas you know the viscosity you know the osmolarity you know that the exact number of calories which have been delivered to the patients and the exact number of proteins the carbohydrates and the lipids which have been delivered to the patients and these other things which will not precipitate much amount of diarrhea mind you the exact delivery of the nutrition support is going to occur as long as you are using the scoops which have been been delivered and the feeds are been prepared by the scoops uh, which have been given by the company because every scoop or the every tin or the sachet of whatever nutrition support of any company use it it has a medical prescription and the contents of every gram or a per scoop or per sachet what is been delivered to the patient and therefore you must know that you must also have a definite assessment of for us how many sachets and how many scoops are going to be required and that is very very important and the chances of precipitation of loose motions is not every time because of the feed mind you the tube clocking is very high especially if you are using a high osmolarity in kitchen feeds and not much with 
that with the commercially available formula feeds. And of course, when you're feeding it, see that before feeding and after feeding, you have to flush the tube that's with simple water and see that if the feed has been prepared and if you're using the gravitational bag or a feeding tube, see that the hanging time of the fluid or the prepared feed is not more than six hours to eight hours. That is very, very important in order to avoid complications. Diarrhea is one of the important things which always people keep on saying. Diarrhea is not caused every time because of the feed, but mind you, it could be because of the prolonged use of prokinetics, what you are using. And these critical ill patients have been in the intensive care units on XYZ, obtained number of antibiotics for a long period of time. So my friends always keep in mind C. difficile infections or pseudomembranous colitis. You have to rule it out. And definitely that has to be taken into consideration and look for other toxicities of any other drugs, what you have been using, which is there. The guidelines have again suggested that parental nutrition support, be it in any form, whether it's burns, trauma, head injury, everything, the use of parental nutrition support is the utmost important. Supplement them and sometimes only in those patients or uh, those who cannot tolerate, as I said, you should divert it into the lower intestinal tract. But you can definitely, there is no study or no things which say that it has to be initiated only lower down. No, you can start initiating the feed from the stomach. And in case if the patients cannot tolerate it, there is intractable vomiting or some problems, then you can divert it into the post pyloric kind of feeding. Please assess all your patients as per the guidelines within the first 24 to 48 hours. Have the nutrition prescription ready and try to achieve almost 80% of the calorie goals within the first 72 hours to have and reduce the morbidity as well as mortality into these patients. Give them adequate number of calories and proteins, about 1.2 to 2 grams of proteins or may be required. Of course, higher may be required in patients of burns or trauma into these patients. And definitely not only give them macronutrients, but also take into consideration the micronutrient content, which is equally important. Now, the monitoring is equally important. Of course, the dietitian's role is not only to plan the nutrition prescription, but I personally feel the dietitian should also be involved into the monitoring of the patients or the delivery of the patients by discussing with the sister on duty and the doctors on duty, whether the amount of feed or the nutrition prescriptions of eight feeds or 10 feeds, what you have planned for delivery of the patient, be it be of 100 ml or 150 ml or whatever it is there, whether they have been delivered to the patients. You commonly see patients always or relatives always telling us the feed the feed has not been given or why the feed was not being given that also needs to be seen whether the patient was shifted for a gastrostomy whether the patient was shifted for a surgery whether the patient is now being operated and has been kept in BM so mind you you need to alter the nutrition prescription that time and you need to have the bypasses of the nutrition prescription but at any given of time see that definitely you don't compromise the nutrition prescription look for the passage of flavor see the radiological evaluations. Of course, see that there is no amount of distension or monitor for loose motions. And you can definitely see whether the patient needs a continuous or bolus feed or you need to pay give into a continuous infusion. Feeds needs to be given to the patients. So monitoring is important along with the monitoring of the hemograms, the sugar, the electrolytes, the RFTs, the liver functions, the ammonia levels, and depending upon the need be of patient to patient. And that is equally important along with the hemodynamics of the patient. Now, whether these selected specialty formulas are available, we have got the, uh, the branch chain amino acid content is more, especially when you are using it into hepatic failure patients. You have got especially post dialysis or the renal uh, formulas, which are available into it from varies to vary. We have also got the, uh, the respiratory formulas, which are available. So these disease specific formulas should be used only into medical ICUs and specialty indications only and not as a part of all patients and otherwise all patients should require other standard polymeric formula feeds and depending upon the need be, you have also taken into consideration the volume requirements of the patient, the volume state of the patients, how much amount of cumulative volume deficit he has or a cumulative plus deficit problems he has. So that's maintaining the U volume is equally important whenever you are planning the dilutions as well as the prescriptions into it and initiation should normally be done by standard polymeric formulas. Mind you, the immunonutrition definitely was being good initially. There was even the fish oils were being included as a part of the ARDS uh, treatment in the anti-inflammatory because of his anti-inflammatory levels in patients 
definitely there, there have been studies and now they have been removed from the guidelines of ISPEN. Yes, definitely because of the generation of the heat shock proteins and also because of the decreased amount of translocation of bacteria from the gut. And these are various precursors for other good important amino acids. Definitely immunonutrition played a very important role. But the Daryl Hill trial which came up uh, from there it suggested that the redox trial, that it precipitated a renal failure into these patients of medical ICUs in patients of sepsis. And therefore, these patients were no longer being now considered for use into uh, medical ICUs where there is septic shock or where there is evidence of renal dysfunction. Mind you, there have been controversies and discussions from the Daryl Hayden paper or the redox trial where Paul Wishmeyer, a good friend, again came up with a study where he showed positive results with uh, glutamine into subset of patients. But mind you, as of now, into uh, these fish oils or these glutamine levels or arginine for immunomodulation do not have a role into medical ICUs. Mind you, in surgical ICUs, definitely in patients of trauma, burns, initial levels of glutamines are on the lower side, and definitely in patients of traumatic brain injury or severe malignant cachexias, and these are in persons of burns. These patients are in the perioperative into surgical ICUs, uh, which Dr. Reddy will agree. Still, there is a role and place for using glutamine into these subset of patients, but mind you, there should not be element of septic shock or mind you, there should not be element of an renal dysfunction into intensive care units. As I said, they are no longer being recommended for immune modulation formulas as far as the evidence and the guidelines have considered. Now, the various peptides or the easily digestible, partially digested mixed formula feeds are also equally available. Mind you, they should be again reserved for use only into these subset of patients who cannot tolerate the standard polymeric formula feeds because these only should be used by patients of malabsorptions, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's. There is persistence of diarrhea or malabsorption is there. And therefore, they should not be used into all patients just to avoid a diet. To avoid a diarrhea, you should not use it and you should use it only in reserved form into a very uh, specific number of subset of population and similarly use these fermentable soluble fibers can be given in divided doses only if there is evidence of diarrhea, but just to avoid diarrhea, it should not be used. Remember, as I said, macronutrients are important where you give good amount of proteins, but along with the use of macronutrients, you have to supplement the micronutrients, which are equally important. The various vitamins, the copper, the selenium are equally important because they play an important role as far as wound healing in surgical patients or difficult to wean patients in mechanical ventilation. And even patients of burns or trauma or patients of liver cirrhosis who have been on long-standing alcoholics where there's a magnesium deficiency. And this will all, if you give it, then there will be a decreased chances of pressing precipitation of the so-called critical care neuropathy, which really occurs, which we don't know why, but it's usually a cocktail deficiency of multiple or irregular proper nutrition support, which has not been given to these patients. Of course, now various apps and technologies been available. I tried to use it into my ICUs for precise delivery using, in, in using artificial intelligence. Definitely our chances improved. Our, definitely our nutrition prescription was much more better. And we did come up with the A-Star Nutrition app along with the PhD colleague, along with the MIT Institute of Technology. And just yesterday, last week, we have been granted patent from the Intellectual Property of India for planning on delivery of nutrition prescription. And therefore, my friends, as I said, not all fingers are together and one and the same. Not all patients are one and the same. So the nutrition prescription needs to be planned within the first 24 hours. They have to individualize it. See that you give nutrition support precisely with precision, with a real feedback time and a dynamic kind of data which is being collected. It has to be monitored, not only planned, and so as to reduce the morbidity and mortality into patients. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, I think now we can take the questions. So, uh, I think you can start the panel and uh, the panel itself will have all the questions coming in. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to know from the other panelist perspective, uh, the role of uh, feeding in the critically ill patient. So Dr. Ravindra Reddy, sir. Uh, you can hear me. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, at the outset, Dr. Subal, an excellent and a very informative and insightful lecture. Thank you. Uh, 
quite a few points which I was not aware of. I learned. Thank you once again. Now, one of the pivotal points in any patient who is admitted to any ICU, irrespective of the cause for which the person is admitted, is actually to reduce the inflammatory process, right? Because the gut is a driver of inflammation, and the only way we can do that is by enteral feeds. Now, we all know that there is some element of gut dysfunction in patients who are uh, critically ill or admitted to the ICU, or any ICU for that matter, and hence it's better to actually give the patient minimal enteral feeds, or what is called estrophic feeds. Start at 10, 15, 20 ml, uh, oh. and gradually pro progress it uh, every 12 hours, one to the patient. Now, the good thing about this is in, even if the patient is on multiple inotropes, but a stable level of inotropes and the mean arterial pressure is at 50 and above, then we can start minimal enteral feeds. Now, if we inherit a patient who is also malnourished, and the guidelines say that we need to start parental supplementation very early on because trophic feeds do not give calories, even though they maintain the gut integrity. But if the patient is not severely malnourished, then we can wait for four to five days. In the meantime, if the gut um, is not able to function or tolerate the adequacy of both calories and other fluids, then it's better to supplement parental nutrition. But the pivotal role is actually the enteral feed because gut is a driver of most of the uh, ill effects which we see in the ICU. And one of one ways to actually dampen or the anti-inflammatory effect is actually through enteral feeds. Thank you. Yes, thank you, sir. So welcome, Dr. Khalid. So what is your view on critical care nutrition? Hello. The one uh, comment which I read was how will you measure uh, by ultrasound muscle thickness? which muscles you will use. And I think that was how one of the question was. The muscles that uh, ideally you need to measure are the quadriceps. You can measure uh, the quadricep muscle or if you use the lower limb muscle, you can measure gastrocnemius or tibialis anterior. And then you have to follow this muscle thickness over the next uh, two to three days. And that is how I think it will be you will be able to measure but it is a steep learning curve i think you must be able before you can do ultrasound of muscles i think you will have to learn a little bit about measuring the muscles yeah how about the body composition analysis do you do body composition analysis routinely i would like to know from you and other panelists also can contribute so, so before we go to this question, yeah, yeah. so let me just uh, uh, have the perspective from the dietitian side also. So with us, Pooja, Pooja is the founder of one of the uh, nutritional program, the Poshan Mantra Private Limited. So Pooja, you are there? Yes. So, Am I audible? Yeah. So can so what is there as a dietitian? You have the role of the dietitian is very important. So yes. So what is your perspective in this? So. Uh... I feel from the guideline point of view, a lot has been beautifully covered by our presenter and uh, other panelists. The only thing I'd like to add in here is a lot of times we do perform the nutritional status assessment. And what we find is uh, because SGA score and other scores have their own limitation, they rely on weight loss, they rely on nutritional intake, gastric symptoms. These may not be present in a major uh, population of patients who are admitted to the ICU, especially those who are admitted with acute conditions. So an acute trauma, acute injury, or if there is acute pancreatitis, these patients typically may not have any symptom before they were admitted to the ICU. And hence, they will essentially be assessed as well-nourished. Now, if you look at the guidelines, the guidelines suggest that for a well-nourished patient, you can wait for EN and PN from 7 to 14 days. But what, what we need to focus on is these patients have a very, very high catabolic activity. Their demands are very high. And hence, a serial assessment should be done, especially in patients who are deemed well-nourished at the time of admission. For chronically uh, ill patients or for malnourished patients, we have got guidelines which tell us when to start, how to progress, how to proliferate. I feel the one, uh, the population, the, the ICU population that get, gets majorly ignored are the ones who are acutely ill 
also because initially uh, their clinical stabilization uh, takes away all the uh, focus and concentration so what uh, needs to be done is a routine assessment is a serial assessment how the patient is doing in terms of the clinical progress and as well as the nutritional status one thing which is uh, coming up and is gaining a lot of focus in our uh, fraternity is the nutrition focused physical examination where a dietitian looks for physical signs and symptoms of fat loss and muscle mass loss and this is very very subjective you may rely on weight loss and nutritional intake and all of that but look for signs of fat and muscle loss and these are very simple you look at the uh, the periorbital region you look at the scapula you look at the calf muscle uh, thickness and all of that and these are subjective very easily accessible parameters that can guide with when to start and how to progress your um, nutritional care of plan plan of care sorry sir uh, what is your view on bio reactance and bio impedance because nowadays lot of newer modality of uh, monitoring has come so any idea sir dikh sir no honestly i i am not monitoring these things usually i monitor is the serum albumin levels the sugar levels and sometimes recently i have asked my my students in my intensive care units to monitor the muscle thickness we are still into the learning phase into it we have just mon started monitoring the muscle thickness for the patients what khalid just said but i am not using any bio impedance i think dr ravinder reddy will throw better light onto it dr subal yes thank you we were using uh, bia we were also using the uh, chair stand test we were also using the gait speed test those who walk less than uh, 800 cm or 0.8 meters per second for both males and females and for hand grip strength those who had less than about 12 to 15 in females and less than 20 kg uh, in the both dominant and non dominant hands is a muscle function and those who were how many times they were able to stand up and sit in uh, 30 seconds as such if they were able to do less than 3 times in 30 seconds then we know that their muscle function is inappropriate these are the for, for the muscle functions now for the muscle mass bioelectrical impedance which is relatively a non invasive one unless the patient is in ckd uh, or uh the other invasive ones are the dexa ones but there is an element of radiation so also mri which is quite costly and if the patient is undergoing a ct scan for some reason then the uh lean body mass at the level of l2 vertebra especially at the abdominal muscles and including the psoas it gives us a very good uh, indication in fact um, dr adarsh choudhury from vedanta has got a prospective study on this showing that those who had a less it's called a skeletal muscle index those who have a very low skeletal muscle index their complications were quite high even though their length of stay sorry their complications were same but the length of stay was quite prolonged as such in our own study which was uh, it was one of the theses of my student it was uh, picked up as the best theses for 2022 in whole of india we did a Uh, hand grip strength was the surgical outcomes this was a prospective uh, open label study so basically we are just looking at the uh, muscle grip strength and looking at the outcome both in terms of the surgical site infections as well as the stay in the hospital and those who had a suboptimal hand grip strength not surprisingly showed that they had uh, increased incidence of surgical site infections as well as prolonged stay compared to those with a normal grip strength coming back to the last point of ultrasound as dr subal has said we are still in the learning phase but in our hospital instead of gastrocnemius and other things they use the rectus femoris mainly because there was um, our radiologist to whom i gave this article did it on rectus femoris muscle and uh, also it's quite easy to insonate it's quite superficial easy to insonate and actually look at the cross sectional diameter of rectus femoris muscle both pre during and in on uh, the patient who's coming for follow up it's a very good uh, thing uh, non invasive easy can be done in outpatient if we can train ourselves one of my post graduates is actually trained in this the one who actually has done the thesis has trained herself on this but then 
uh, muscle mass, be it critically ill patients or in elective surgery, uh, emergency surgery, or even transplant surgery has a very bad impact if the patient has sarcopenia. Dr. Subal, thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you. So uh, basically, bioreactance uh, uh, principles uh, are quite useful in analyzing uh, uh, the muscle mass. Not only that, but you will also be able to identify how much is the edema, which uh, way, how much is the water accumulation. Sometimes we really don't know how much is the, you know, water accumulation or the positive balance. So with these bioreactance methods, we will be able to delineate how much is the positive balance and how much is to be removed and uh, uh, which muscles are uh, you know, uh, sarcopenic and what kind of uh, exercises or physiotherapy can also be uh, you know employed. So bioreactance will be a very useful tool, but it still depends upon uh, how, uh, how much is the energy that is being transmitted, how much is absorbed. It, it still has uh, uh, no variability. So it's still a matter of debate, but there are centers which are using the bioreactance methods to analyze the fluid balance and muscle uh, sarcopenia and all that. So I would like to know from uh, Dr. Sumit Rai, I mean, what is your practice uh, about you know, medical care nutrition in your uh, organization? Dr. Sumit? Hi, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Flesh. Uh, firstly, uh, it's a great talk, uh, Dr. Tixit. Uh, excellent talk. Um, very comprehensive. You can remove the mask. Uh, I'm in the hospital, uh, so it's a bit difficult. Um, so as far as the practice here uh, where I work, I, I don't think it's any different from what uh, Dr. Dixit has so beautifully explained. Um, what we would usually do is start feeds within 24 hours. We're a big pro-feeding unit. So, um, and if our patient is hemodynamically stable, we actually go to gold rate feeds. Um, so once we've uh, approximated their feeds, that is because we know in critically ill patients, um, there is a significant period of time that their feeds are stopped, either because they're going um, to a scan, they're going to surgery, uh, or whatever the reason might be. So even when you start goal rate feeds, you only effectively deliver between 60 and 80% um, feeds. But, yeah, and that is as for the guidelines that we should try to aim um, to achieve around 70 to 80% feeds in the first uh, five to seven days. Um, the only patients we are worried about, uh, of course, is the malnourished patients. Uh, we, uh, our dietitian keeps us on our toes, really, uh, by coming to tell us that uh, we've not been feeding the patients correctly or uh, they're behind their feeds. Uh, and that way, we're able to adjust our um, goal rate uh, to feeds. But we do continuous feeding um, by using an approximate uh, formula, uh, which there is no real difference between any of these formulas anyway. So we use uh, 20 to 25 kilocals uh, per kilogram um, as the goal nutrition for, for our patients at the bedside. Um, and then within 24 hours, all our ICU patients are uh, evaluated by the dietitian. Um, I think just going back on, um, um, I think uh, what some of the panelists have said before, I think the biggest concern is not the patients who are intubated, because I think everybody's good now at starting enteral feeds soon. I think it's those ones who are not intubated, but are critically ill and in our intensive care unit. Um, we you know, get them a diet plan, but we have no idea how they are eating because nobody really keeps a food chart of how much they've consumed. And as you all know, the critically ill patients often have significant lack of appetite. Um, and they are those ones who unfortunately fall in through the cracks um, where they aren't uh, getting the nutrition because we expect they're eating and they've got a food tray in front of them. Um, and we don't keep a very close eye on those patients. But uh, uh, that's uh, all from me. And uh, happy to answer any other questions. Sir, one more question for you by one of the our doctor, Dr. Sopil. So high protein diet in CKD patients and uh, on dialysis, sir. Any sort of tip? I'm not a renal physician or a renal dietitian. I think Pooja is better sort of to answer that. I would have thought uh, lower uh, protein, uh, but given their critical illness and depending on what their critical illness is and what kind of dialysis they are on, if they are on CRRT, 
which is commonly the practice in Australia, we wouldn't restrict uh, proteins. Um, if they are on intermittent hemodialysis, of course, uh, that is a completely different issue. Uh, but I'm sure Pooja can answer that uh, better. Yeah, Pooja, from your side. Thank you. So uh, going by the guidelines for critically ill patients, even if your patient has a renal failure with or without dialysis, as Dr. Rai said, we do not restrict protein uh, prescriptions or protein provision for these patients. The bare minimal that you need to meet for these patients is 1.5 kilogram per kg per day. Now, the challenge here is which kilogram? Because the patient, if the patient is intubated, not able to move, you do not know the accurate weight, your prescription may not be as accurate. Uh, one good way to go about it is know the usual body weight. So you could interact with the patient or ask the relative, reach out to the relatives and find out what was the usual body weight. Otherwise, you could measure patient's accurate height. There are many uh, methods you could, uh, which will help you eventually measure the height of the patient and go by the uh, um, uh, ideal body weight and plan nutrition prescription that way. 1.5 grams is bare minimal. Now, again, one problem which we face here is there is a high protein supplement which has been prescribed to the patient in what dose and for how long is what is important. So a dietitian is planning that there has to be a record of how much feed the patient is receiving. That record will tell you what is the calorie or protein deficit. If you're meeting 60 to 80 percent of your calorie prescription, that is where you're achieving your nutrition goals. 80 percent by first 72 hours and uh, 70 percent of calories is what we need. So 1.5 gram protein per kg per day, whatever uh, ideal body weight or usual body weight you have on record, and then uh, auditing how much protein that patient is receiving every day. 80% within 72 hours of proteins and 70% of calories. If that answers, I mean. Yeah, that covers everything, Pooja. Thank you. So really, uh, today's uh, discussion was very intense and uh, really thank you, Shubhanti uh, sir, for your wonderful uh, talk. And I think uh, students must have definitely benefited out of it. And I must thank all the panelists today. Uh, uh, I think we are short of time, uh, already spent uh, more than one hour. So with this, I would like to conclude the session. Yes, uh, and, uh, please, just, just a last question from one of, one of the one of the uh, distinct delegate, Dr. Hemant. So how to manage nutrition in a fluid restricted patient, say only 800 ml in one liter of uh, this thing lights? If you restrict the fluid, so how to manage the nutrition? Dr. Khalid, so if you... Yeah, thank you. Alisa, thank you. Alisa, yeah, yeah. So, what you will have to use will be energy dense and uh, protein dense. Uh, if you are feeding enterally, then you will have to use energy and protein dense uh, formula. And maybe you might have to add some, uh, ideally some partial parenteral or you might have to use some supplemental protein. I think uh, you're going to restrict, that is the only you can give addict, an addict energy to the patient. So ready, sir. Sir, your views on how to manage the nutrition if the patient is being fluid restricted? Yeah. Sir, you are mute. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So it is really a challenging uh, scenario when uh, A, the protein requirements are high, the calorie requirements are high, and on the other side, the patient is challenged as far as fluid is concerned because of cardiac issues or renal issues or uh, liver issues. In, in such scenario, I think as the previous uh, panelist has uh, did, uh, did mention, it's ideal to give at least two kilo. The, the, some of the formulas are available which give about two kilo calories per ml. 
personally, I'm not aware of any, uh, at least in India, maybe they are, but not to my knowledge, that there are more than uh, 2.5, no, more than 2 kilocalories per ml. So we can perhaps give. At the same time, if the patient has, has no issues as far as infusion of fats are concerned is, I actually give this patient, you know, a parental uh, nutrition, which is about which is just about 1,000 ml, if I can get away with that. Um, uh, because some of them are uh, rich. At times, I, I have even given only pure lipid emulsions, intravenous lipid emulsions, to actually achieve the calorie requirements, being mindful not to cross 0.75 or one gram per kilogram body weight of fats in these individuals, whilst keeping an eye on serum triglycerides, because we don't want a lipidemic syrup in these individuals. So it is surely a challenging case, uh, challenging scenario. But then at times, if let's say we calculated requirements are for the sake of discussion, let's say about 2000 kilocals. And even if you are achieving 1200 to 1300 or even 1400 kilocals, perhaps it's, it's all right, uh, given the fluid restriction, because we do want to, the, to you know, uh, fill the patient more and have the antecedent side effects of overfilling the patient, especially when the underlying uh, dysfunction of either the heart or the lung or the, lung or the kidneys or the liver are there. So high caloric formulas can be essential at the same time, keeping a very close eye on these patients. Uh, a clinical outcome at the same time, the biochemical parameters to see if we are doing any good thing to the patient or the patient is on the right path to achieve a positive clinical outcome. Thank you. So if I may just add to this, so if we uh, pick up this one value of 800 ml and you have a formula which can provide two kilocalories per ml, you can easily achieve 1600 kilocalories, which I feel will fit into most of the patient's 70 to 80% of requirements. Absolutely. In this same planning, if you, for example, have a four hourly feeding cycle or a six hourly feeding cycle, then in this case, you need to probably give three feeds of a high calorie formula with one feed of a high protein formula. And that, that will do the, that will help you meet the requirements in most cases. Again, what we, I, I'm sure you all would agree that these fluid restrictions are not going to stay for the entire stay of patient in the ICU. They're transient. After about, say, five days, seven days, we will have these fluid uh, uh, provisions being increased. And that is where you can uh, increase your nutritional provision. But it's not so difficult. We've got commercially uh, well-balanced formulas available, which will help you meet protein and calorie requirements within 800 to 1,000 ml. There's just a combination that needs to be made. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, now Good. we have got the pediatric three in one bags, which are also available with 384 yes. ml. So, those bags also can be used into these subset of patients. Yes, Absolutely. but uh, yes, that will help. But in most cases, we may not need that. Yeah, I agree with you. So, any more questions? Uh, no, I, I agree with the uh, CKD or any of the fluid-restricted patients as well. Um, I think as Pooja was saying, the most important thing is none, as far as I'm aware, none of the two kilocal feeds have enough protein. So you have to supplement the protein in some way. So when you do put them on that um, high caloric uh, feed uh, formulation to reduce the volume requirements, you have to think about protein. Um, because you are unlikely to deliver the protein requirements for someone like that who is critically ill and who definitely needs more protein. Yeah, thank you, Sumit, sir. So I think we don't have any questions so, in that box. So, uh, so any message, uh, you know, uh, in short words, if, if you all can give it to the students. Any tips about nutritional delivery, and nutritional prescription? Shubal Dukshit, sir, from you. It's very simple that don't Inside. neglect nutrition, plan your nutrition prescription, analyze patients, see that nutrition is started, achieve 80% of the caloric goals, and discuss everything with the dietitian. 
Yeah, multidisciplinary I'll her, team. I'll take him or her along with you on the rounds for the nutrition prescription. Yes, yes. Very yes, simple. Yes. Name power. Yes, yes. No, that's very so, important. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Khalid. Yes. Khalid, sir. Ravinder, so you are on the mute, I think. Yeah, I, uh, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Subal. A multidisciplinary team is much better. If we can have a nutrition support team, which includes everyone and nothing like it, because the benefits have been shown umpteen number of times, especially in the ICU. Uh, because perhaps we as clinicians are not aware of many of the nuances in which the uh, clinical nutritionists or dietitians will actually get away by actually feeding the patient uh, to a much optimal level than what we can fathom as clinicians. Because a, they are experts in these. So hats off to at least my dietitians and they come up with amazing ingenuity, ingenious ideas and we generally get away with feeding the patient. Maybe about 30% of the times resorting to parental nutrition, but at least 70 to 75% of the times you don't need to do that. As uh, one of the panelists has rightly said, especially in uh, mm -hmm. if we concentrate more on calories, we might, uh, not, we might forget to give adequate proteins and amino acids. So at times we need to be mindful of that fact. So I echo what Dr. Sawal has said, think of nutrition in every patient irrespective of the pathology for which the person is admitted to your ICU. Thank you. Khalid sir, from your side. Sir, you are mute. You are mute, sir. Sir, you are on mute. Another point, I think, once we have calculated calories as well as uh, proteins, I think you must not forget micronutrients. And uh, that is where, you know, see, that is what we must not forget. We concentrate only on calories and proteins and uh, these micronutrients, they might get lost in the whole scenario. So we have to also look at micronutrients and then supplement them in patients who are deficient. Yes. So that will take care of the entire uh, nutrition. Yeah. So, any take puja from your side? So, it's been, uh, I echo uh, whatever uh, my uh, seniors and other panelists had to say. I'd just like to add this small bit is it's very important that you have a top to down nutrition management protocol as well. The way you have a protocol for managing a ventilated patient, a patient who's come post-trauma, post-surgery, there's a very beautiful pen down protocol and everyone sticks to it. It's important that you have a talk to down nutrition management protocol as well. Which patient will require what mode of nutrition, when to progress, when to change, uh, diarrhea, uh, I mean, feed interruptions, how to manage, it's very, very important. And audits are also equally important. That's how you'll know if your protocol is working well. So I think I'd like to sum up by saying this. Thank you. The monitoring is also very important. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've got anything left to say. Uh, Pooja and everybody else has explained that very well. Um, all I can probably conclude by um, is to say, I don't think there is a dilemma in to feed or not. Um, the dilemma is um, how soon to feed um, and to essentially think about feeding early and using uh, an enteral uh, or a feeding protocol, essentially, and involving a dietitian in every critically ill patient. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Subal Dixit, sir, for your presentation and uh, you come out of your busy schedule. I must thank you for, on behalf of our Apollo Physical Care team. And I, I also thank uh, uh, D, sir, for your valuable feedbacks. Really, it was amazing. And I also thank uh, Dr. Khalid, also. I mean, yes. your feedback on nutrition should also be emphasized. And I also thank uh, uh, Sumit, sir for your you know, insights and with this we would like to conclude the session and uh, hope to see you again and again because nutrition the discussions are quite intense you know there is a lot to discuss on that hope to see you again and again thank, thank you. you for now today bye thank, bye. You. thank, you. thank, thank you. you thank you very thank much you. Thank, thank you very much bye bye thank you bye bye, bye.
थैंक यू पूजा थैंक्स थैंक यू पूजा